Well, good morning, church. It's a good day to be alive, isn't it? Come on, if you are breathing, you have something to rejoice. <laughs> Even if that's all it is, it's okay, it's okay. Come on, let's pray together, church. Father God, we just invite you into this space. Lord, I don't mean into this room, I mean into our hearts. Lord, in this moment right now, we just, we take a second to breathe. We take a second to remember that hallowed is your name. And you're as close to us as the very air that we breathe, that there's nothing we have to do right now to make you come any closer than you already are. Lord, there's nothing that we can do to make you love us any more than you already do. And so, Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters here today. Spirit, would you speak to us individually? Would you speak to our hearts? Lord, would you course correct the things in our life that need to be changed? Father, would you challenge us to go deeper and to go further than we ever have before, Lord? Lord, we invite you into this space, not just to hear from you, but to be transformed by the work of your Spirit. I just believe in this room there are people who you came here today and you just said, God, if you don't break through today, I give up. And it's like you drew a line in the sand and I just believe the Spirit of God is speaking to you today. And he says, I see you. I hear you. Change is coming. If you'll align your life, if you'll listen to my words and dwell and meditate on my Spirit, I will do something so profound in your life. I believe that today, just as we sung, something has to break. And so in Jesus' name, Lord, as we come together in this room, Father, on the day of Pentecost, you fill the room with your spirit. And I thank you that in this place, you're filling the room with your spirit right now, Lord. We worship you. We acknowledge you. In Jesus' name, can we all say amen? Amen, amen. Thank you so much, Sam. Let's give it up for Sam. She's awesome. It's Sam's birthday today, am I correct? It is. Happy birthday, Sam. Woohoo! How old are you? Can I ask? Okay, you can't tell me. All right. These young guns on there. I can't tell you. 21. Like, uh. <laughs> I'm getting old. Oh, be quiet. Man, it's good to be here today. I'm excited to share the word with you. I have a question for you. Um, how in control of your life do you feel like you are? Just let that one sink in for a little bit. As we think and ponder over the areas of, my, of your life, not my life. As you think about your life, how in control are you really? And, and that's really what I want to talk about today. Today I'm going to unpack Galatians 5, and it's a very common piece of Scripture. It's something that if you've been a part and walked with church for a while, you may have seen it many, many times. And if you're new here today... Uh, we just want to welcome you in. I'm so glad you're here with us today. And maybe this is brand new for, new, for you. And um, I want to try and break it down so it's really practical and easy to, to run with. But Galatians 5 talks about these fruits of the Spirit. And there's nine of them uh, as described here by Paul. I don't know if that's an exhaustive list, if that's sort of all there are. But there's certainly nine mentioned. And we can't go through all nine today. But we will. I want to focus on one. And it's the, the one I think is the most difficult. Whenever, have you ever sat in a small group and you discuss the fruits of the Spirit, because that's what you do in a small group, and you sit there and you talk about them, which one do you struggle with? There's always two that people struggle with, and maybe you agree with me or maybe not, but it's patience. All right, that's a hard one, right? None of, no one has ever prayed the prayer, Lord, give me patience, because you know what's going to happen. God's just going to surround you with annoying people all day, every day. And, uh, you know, you won't just have one kid, you'll have triplets, and it's like... <laughs> Beware what you wish for. Um, patience being one of those things that we really struggle with in life. And, and, and I like the Amplified Version, which we're going to read in a minute, because the Amplified Version doesn't say it's not just about waiting, but it's about your attitude that you have while you're waiting. Because we're all forced to wait at times. We've all sat in the dentist's office, or we've all sat waiting for that slow waitress. But that's not what patience is, because we all have to wait. Patience is what's the disposition of your heart while you are forced to wait longer than you want to wait. So that one we really struggle with, amen? I think the other one that we really find difficult, particularly in our culture today, is self-control. 
And so I want to talk about self-control today. I want to unpack that a little bit. And, and look, it's really simple. I want to look at a couple things we try to control that we really shouldn't be controlling. And then I want to look at things that we should be controlling that we often subcontract out to other people and to other sources in order for us to control. And so it's going to be a good time. Hey, just very quickly, would you um, join me in welcoming? We have two of my Danish friends. Now, this is David and Annette. David used to be my old, 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 back in the day when I was really young youth pastor, when I first came to, to Denmark. And so they're visiting uh, here this weekend. Would you join me in welcoming them? It's so good to have them here. Yeah, you guys can stand up. He's, he's easy to spot. He's about seven foot tall and uh, Danish Viking. So it's so good to have you, have you with us. And uh, yeah, they're, they're here. Annetta is here doing her PhD with the University of Maryland. So they're here for a couple of weeks. Yeah, smarter than a lot of us. <laughs> All right. Um, how in control do you really feel like you are of your life? It's, it's quite a difficult question to answer. Um, Whoever's doing the words back there, we're going to jump down to the amplified version, which is that second scripture. So let's have a look here at Galatians 5. And I'm actually going to go through the whole thing. Often people jump down halfway through this passage of scripture. But I want to start what I would consider more at the beginning, which is in uh, uh, verse number 19. I have chosen the amplified here. Please don't get, some people get a little bit snobby when it comes to their versions of the Bible or translations of the Bible. There are different translations for different reasons. I think the amplified is really helpful when it comes to this particular text. So let's read this together. It says, now the practices of the sinful nature are clearly evident. They are, and he lists them here. So if you're living out of the flesh, some translations call it, or a sinful nature, It'll be, it'll be evident for people to see, and these are the kinds of things that become evident in your life. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, which is total irresponsibility or lack of self-control. Uh, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, disputes, dissensions, fractions that promote heresies in particular, envy, drunkenness, how about this one? Riotous behavior, because we haven't seen any of that in the last couple of years. And other things like these, he says, I warn you beforehand, just as I did previously, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Just pause there for a second. It's just really important to note. He says, practice those things. And in other words, if they are becoming a lifestyle for you, we all make mistakes. We all slip up. We all have seasons of our life where we wish we, you know, we weren't as weak-willed as we are. He's not talking about that. He's talking about what becomes practice and a lifestyle in your life. He, he says it's going to be very difficult for you to experience the abundant life that Jesus sacrificed his life for you to have if you live that way. And so I should probably say this very quickly as well. We're talking about fruits. Fruits are things that grow and develop in your life. They're very different from gifts. Just very quickly, if you have the difference between gift and a fruit, they're two different trees. The gift is like a Christmas tree. If you have a present under there, it doesn't tell you anything about the tree itself. If you walk in Christmas morning, and you see all the presents under the Christmas tree, that doesn't tell you if you open up the gift, it doesn't matter how expensive the gift is or how cheap the gift is, how elaborate it is. It doesn't tell you anything about the tree, whether it's dead or whether it's alive or what type of tree it is. When you open up the gift, it tells you something about the generosity of the giver itself, okay? So there are gifts of the Spirit. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about fruits of the Spirit. Fruits of the Spirit is like a fruit tree. And if you pick a fruit from a fruit tree, it tells you everything you need to know about that fruit. If you pick a fruit and it's an orange, it tells you it's an orange tree, more than likely. It tells you whether it's in season or out of season. It tells you whether it's alive or whether it's dead, whether it's healthy or whether it's not healthy. The fruit tells you about the tree. So in other words, the fruit of your life tells me everything I need to know about you as a person. It tells me everything I need to know about your character. It tells me everything I need to know about your walk with the Spirit of God. All I, I don't really have to know much about you. I just have to see what you produce in your life. And so Paul says, if you live separate from God, that's what sin is, if you're missing the mark, this is the kind of fruit that you will see. It's a lack of self-control. It's giving into your inhibitions, particularly when it comes to sexuality. Uh, it, it's that you become angry, that you're not long-suffering. It's that you have riotous behavior. You become jealous. You become envious. 
And so if those things are beginning to become fruit in your life, it may be time to examine who, um, where you are planted at the moment and what is feeding your life. Does that make sense? Okay, so he juxtaposes living by the flesh and living by God's spirit. And this is what he says here in uh, verse uh, 22. But joy, so listen to this. But joy, oh, sorry. Uh, but the fruit of the spirit results in his presence within us is, sorry, love, which is an unselfish concern for others. Joy, inner peace. So often we're looking for outer peace, but he talks about an inner peace that resides, a shalom that, that rests within our hearts. Patience, listen to this, not the ability to wait, but how we act while we're waiting. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness. And then he finishes with the one I wish he hadn't put in there, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. In other words, there's no prohibition to how far and how much you can grow in these things. It's not like one day you go, I have arrived, I am now patient. <laughs> because once you say that, you know what will happen, right? You, everything will go wrong. Everybody will test your patience. And it's like the point is, there's always more room to grow. God is always going to increase your capacity in these areas of life. And here's the thing about self-control that I want to pick up on. We could talk about all nine of these, but with it, when it comes to self-control, I find that people often try and control things we were never called to control, and then we let go of things that we are actually meant to control. And we say, Jesus, take the wheel on this one. And, and, but actually, a mark of your maturity and maturation with the Spirit of God is that you learn to navigate and control things you're meant to control, and you let go of the things that you cannot control. Let's put up a quick list. Here's three quick things you can't control. I'm not going to talk too long about these today. But, but I think so often we're trying to control particularly the exact outcome. How many people in here, by the way, have control issues? Yeah, I mean, you're sitting next, it's one of, or the other of the spouse. You can nudge your spouse if that's you, like, okay, I have control issues. I, you, are you one of those sick people who makes plans to make plans? You know what I mean? Like, on Monday, we're gonna make plans. I'm like, did you just arrange to make a plan by making a plan? That's a weird thing to do. <laughs> My wife used to say I'm spontaneous, now she just knows I'm disorganized. <laughs> but some of us, we want to control everything. Like a restaurant, where's the restaurant? Where's it going to be? What's the parking like? Is there parking around there? And we have to look at the menu. We've got to know what the menu is. And what am I going to buy? Ooh, I think I might like this, but I don't really know. And it's like we have to control all of these things, the circumstances around us. But you cannot control the exact outcome of how things are going to be. And that is you can control some things. Look, if you save money over a long period of time, the outcome is you'll probably have money right? But you can't always control the exact outcome. You can't always control a global financial crisis. You, there are things that are going to happen in life that are outside of your purview and of your control. In fact, Jesus says, don't even worry about it. Why are you worrying about tomorrow's issues when today's, there's enough of today's issues already on hand? And so I find people trying to control outcomes and getting pretty frustrated when it doesn't go their way. Sometimes we try and control it through our prayers. Lord, make this happen. And we try and control God. Sometimes, we, we, you know, you can't control who you're related to. Amen, right? You were born into that family. Ain't nothing you can do about it. You're stuck with Uncle, weird Uncle Bobby. Like, that's just life. If there's anyone here named Bob, I apologize. I just made that name up. <laughs> or weird Aunt Sue, or whoever it is. <laughs> you know, it's just, that's life, isn't it? They're always going to be there at Thanksgiving. You can't control it. That's life. And you can't control other people. How much of your energy and your time and your emotion and your frustration and your disappointment all results or has resulted in that because you are trying to control other people? You are trying to control an outcome that was not within your purview. Here's the thing about this fruit of the Spirit. The key word here is not control. The key word is self-control. In other words, 
a mark and a sign that the spirit is beginning to function and that you're listening to the spirit inside of your heart is not evidence in the fact that you can manipulate and control other people more efficiently. It's evidenced by the fact that you have a measure of self-control over your own life. Are you following me there? And so here's a couple things. I think we often give over control to other people and we have to take back control in conjunction and in work and in cooperation with the Holy Spirit that functions inside of our life. Are you ready for this? Quick list, things we can control, and I probably should have put here things we ought to control when the Spirit of God is functioning in our life. Number one is our mind. How many people, their minds are out of control right now? And you just feel like, I can't control my thoughts. I can't control my worries. I can't control my anxieties. I can't control my life around me. And, and, and in scripture, there's this word repentance. And repentance is kind of used in two different ways, but they sort of lead to the same thing. In Hebrew, it's this word teshuva, which I've talked about many times in the past. Teshuva means to turn around or to return. It's this idea of returning to the path. I've strayed from God's way of doing things and I need to repent. I need to return. I need to get back on God's path for my life. And so that's a very Hebrew way of looking at repentance, but a very Greek way that Paul talks about is this word metanoia. It's literally a changing of the mind. That if you're going to repent, if you're going to change the way that you do life, it has to begin in between your ears. Not in your ears. It's the thing in between. It has to start in the mind. It has to begin there. In fact, Paul even says, finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is repute, if there's anything of excellence that is worthy talking about, he says, meditate on these things. And I find people give over their minds to the media. They give over their minds to politics. They give over their minds and their thought to where their kids are right now. They give over their minds and it's like everyone else has control and telling me what to think rather than me going to the spirit and saying, spirit, would you help me meditate on the good and the noble things in life? It's amazing how, and maybe you're like me, I think you are, have you ever had, you've done a really great thing, a great job at work or a great presentation or whatever it is, and you got 100 compliments, but then you got one criticism? And that's the one that just like is an arrow into our heart, isn't it? It goes straight in and what do we do? We meditate on why did they think that? Or why did they say that? And da, 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 and we question it and we ponder it and we meditate and we roll over and over. And it's like we're handing over the power of our mind to somebody else and whatever they want to say. And I think we have to take back control. And number two, I think we have to take back control of our tongue. <laughs> Come on, can I hear it? How many people have completely lost control of their tongue from time to time? If your hand isn't up, I know you are lying. 100%. There is no way. And I know that's true because the Bible says it's true. James says, you guys, no one can control the tongue. And we all have to learn to do it with the work of the spirit that's inside of us. The tongue, James says in James 1, is the rudder of your life. Think about that. If you don't like where your life is headed, you should think about the things that are coming out of your mouth. Jesus says, it's not what goes into a man that defiles him, but it's what comes out of his mouth. I would love to discuss that with Jesus because I've definitely eaten some things that have defiled me, but, but sorry, too, too much information. <laughs> We've all had that weird meat from time to time or whatever it is. But there's things that come out of your mouth that will defile you because what is in your heart will eventually come out. And what you speak, there is, there is power in that. There is life and death inside of the tongue. All of creation was created through words. And so you create your realities out of the things that you proclaim in your life. That's why in Psalms it says to put on the garment of praise. Because when you're not feeling it, when you're despondent, when you're broken... When you're feeling just like I'm a little bit jaded today, you need a new proclamation inside of your tongue, inside of your mouth to come out. Here's the thing. I found the things that we tend to do with our tongue is we tend to gossip. Proverbs talks quite clearly about that. In fact, it, in Proverbs, it says that there are seven sins, one of them more detestable than above all the others, and it's gossip. Speaking about other people, when you have no ability to change or to affect the outcome or the situation. In other words, when it has nothing to do with you. 
gossip is one of the things that we do, but I think one of the bigger killers of our life is the complaining that comes out of our mouth. All the time, people complain and they whine and they take offense. You know when you take offense, here's the thing, when people take offense, what they do rather than deal with their own emotion is they'll try and deal with your behavior because they haven't learned how to control what's going on inside of their own minds and hearts. But we complain about everything and it amazes me. Did you know the Israelites, think about this, they were in Egypt for like four or 500 years in captivity, in slavery, in bondage, forced to do labor day in, day out, make bricks, more bricks, more bricks, more bricks. For 500 years, they were stuck in there and they complained. They petitioned to God, free us from this. And God says, I have heard the cry of my people. I've seen their oppression and I'm gonna bring them out. And God does these miracles, the 10 plagues, and it's like there's the frogs and the locusts and there's the, you know, the, 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 the Nile turning red and there's all these incredible miraculous acts and he brings them out of Egypt and as soon as they get out of Egypt, they're faced with another challenge. What's the first thing they do? Moses, did you bring us here to die? It was better back in Egypt. At least we would have lived, really? Isn't it amazing how God can take you out of bondage and slavery, stick you in the promised land and we can still find something to complain about? If you're living in America, come on. If you can't make it here, where are you going to go? Where are you going to go? Where are you going to go? Like, there's nowhere else to go. Like, how much is going to be put in, how much do you need to be put in your hands for you to stop complaining and whining? And it's so often we go, I'm not complaining to God, I'm just praying. No, you're complaining. And Jesus says, don't pray and don't babble like the pagans do. Don't go on and on and on thinking that your Father in heaven will hear you because he already knows what you need before you've even said it. That's really challenging because if Jesus says, don't go on and on and on and don't tell God things you need, what's left? Like, if your prayer life only consists of words and things that you need and Jesus says, no, no, don't use lots of words and don't talk about things you need, what's your prayer life then consist of? What's left? just a thought, something to wrestle with. And then he goes on to teach his disciples how to properly pray. You know, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The hallowed be thy name is this simple idea. Well, let me start by saying this. What's the opposite of hallowed be thy name? It's to profane the name. So hallowed means God's name is holy, right? But to profane the name, but it's not just about his name being holy. It's about hallowed be thy name on my lips. So, so in other words, there's the way that we can live our life that profanes the name of God, or there's the way that we can live our life that shows that the breath of God that God has given us is actually holy and set apart and for a purpose. It's not just about cussing, because I know people who profane the name of God through wasting their life and wasting the gift of the breath that God has given them not necessarily by doing bad things, but by doing wasteful things. And so we can spend hours and hours and hours and hours and hours of our life not doing bad things, but wasting and profaning the name of God. Or we can align with his spirit and begin to say, God, you have given me this precious gift of breath today. Help me not to profane the name. Help me to use it to its greatest ability and capacity because holy is your name. Are you following me there? And so uh, we have to learn how to control our tongues. We often complaining lets us down. Anger certainly lets us down from time to time. Lying lets us down. Oh, I could go into this. In Proverbs, it, it, it says that the more talk, the less truth. <laughs> have you ever noticed when somebody's lying and when they're caught in a lie, it's like blah, 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 it wasn't me and I did this and, that was good. and there's just so many words going on you know that there's lots of lying going on as well uh, and so often we have this mendacious sort of uh, that means a sort of a lying temperament that just becomes a part of our mouth it becomes usual it says but a wise person measures their words number three I think sometimes we subcontract our emotions out we don't know how to deal with our emotions very well mostly because we don't learn how to do conflict very well and so we give over our emotions and we think our emotions 
or we allow emotions to lead our life rather than to guide our life. Emotions are beautiful. Emotions are God-given. God feels emotion, good ones and what we would call bad ones, although I think those are, that's a terrible way to categorize them as good and bad. They just are. They're signposts to what's going on in the way that we perceive the world. They are not meant to rule and govern and dictate your life. They're not meant to get out of control in your life. You see, when you live out of the flesh, it becomes evident because you become riotous. You become angry, quick to anger. Uh, you begin to slur people very sharply. Uh, but I love that a gentle word can break a bone, it says in Proverbs. That there's something about our emotions when we learn how to control them. Isn't that attractive, by the way? Have you ever met anybody who has such great control over their emotions? They never let it run away with them or get away with them. They're just simply signposts. Okay, I feel you, but you're not taking the steering wheel. I've talked about this many times in the past. So often we let our emotions take control of the steering wheel. They're allowed in the car with you. Anger can sit in the passenger seat. He just can't drive. Disappointment is that you're allowed to feel that for a moment. He can sit in the back seat, but don't let him take the steering wheel. Even things like happiness, don't let them take the steering wheel because all you'll do is you'll go back to that thing that gave you happiness time and time again, and it becomes a new slave driver for you. The things that you don't control, you are enslaved to. Are you following me there? Let me just say that again. The things that you can't control in your life, will end up becoming a slave driver in your life. And so I think we hand over our emotions. Oh my goodness, this next one. We hand over our joy and our peace. I always know when people have handed over their happiness and they've subconsciously it out to other people because they'll say things like, this person doesn't make me happy. They were never meant to. No one can carry the burden of making you happy 24-7 or anybody happy 24-7. In fact, that's to set somebody up as an idol. And you set them up eventually to fail, and then we will rebuke them when we, they don't give us all the nice gooey emotions that we want all the time. And that's how romance tends to work nowadays. It's like, what can I get out of it? How do they make me happy? How do they make me feel? Do they satisfy my life? Have you ever thought to ask, are you making your spouse happy? When's the last time you asked that question? When's the last time you asked your spouse that question? Do I bring you joy or do I bring you annoyance? <laughs> Be ready for the answer. <laughs> Bit of both. But we try and, I think sometimes we try and offload our peace. We try and buy peace. We try and buy it with our 401ks. We try and buy security with a nicer house. We try and buy security. When this happens, then I'll feel settled. Then I have peace then I'll experience God's shalom inside of my life. But here's how peace functions. It functions in spite of your circumstances. In other words, there's nothing external to your life that will bring you long-term internal peace. Let me say it another way. Peace derives from the heart. It doesn't go into the heart. It comes out of your heart. Let me put it this way. There was a group of people in a storm and they were in a boat and they were all terrified because of the circumstance around them. And Jesus says, oh, you a little faith, why were you afraid? He wasn't rebuking them because they didn't calm the storm. He rebuked them because they didn't have peace in the middle of the storm. When everything's going wrong, when there's financial ruin, when your kids are being rebellious, when all, everything seems to be breaking up around you, when you get let go from work, those are storms that come into our lives and we find them really difficult to navigate. Peace has to then derive from somewhere from the spirit that dwells within us. And so often we're trying to buy peace from the outside. We're trying to look to our politicians to bring peace into the nation. And Jesus says, I've come, but I've come to do it in a different way. I, I wanna reside and dwell inside of you. And I think finally, our actions as well. So many people, what should I do with my life? I don't know. Why would I know that? Why would anybody but you know that? Get your own conviction. Pray to God. Get down on your hands and knees. 
You know, in Romans, it says that you will be held to account for the way that you lived your life. You can't then turn to Pastor Larry and be like, yeah, but Pastor Larry told me to do that. Isn't that right, Larry? God, see, he told me to do that. No, you made that decision. You have to stand up to that responsibility. And so my question to you is, do you feel like you are in a place where you can get a good account of the actions you are making? Or are you simply not willing to take the responsibility and so you're letting everybody else make the decisions for your life? Well, my mom and dad told me to do this. Well, so-and-so told me to do that. And I just trusted this person's wisdom. Look, it's good to seek advice and mentorship and wisdom, obviously, but you bear the responsibility. Think about this. In the New Testament, it says that we in the church are called a nation of priests. Let that sink in for a second, because in the Old Testament, it's one person, one revelation who speaks for the entire nation. But Jesus comes, and when he breaks through, he says, I'm doing a new thing. I'm giving you all the Spirit of God. He resides in you, in your heart, and it's the Spirit of God that will lead you into all truth. And so all of us have an indwelling, in-speaking Spirit of God that is guiding us, speaking to us, helping us, but we have to open up our ears and stop subcontracting out all of our decisions to other people. And I find people are frustrated and broken and jaded because they're living somebody else's plan for their life. No one else can tell you but the Spirit of God residing inside of you. People can give advice. People can guide. People can give wisdom. But you're responsible for your actions. And people live in such misery because I'm just not happy. Do you know why you're not happy? You gave that job to somebody else to make you happy. I'm just not doing the right things. Well, you know what? You're letting somebody else take control of your actions. Just can't get control of my anxiety in my mind. Yeah, I know, I know. You've let the world begin to control and dominate your thoughts and you've stopped meditating day and night on the Word of God and all that is good, pure and lovely and acceptable. Man, I can't control my tongue. Yeah, I know, because you won't be quiet. (laughs) You're struggling to control your tongue. Shut up. (laughs) I was going to say turn to your neighbor and say shut up, but don't do that. (laughs) But seriously... Even fools are accounted wise when they stay silent. When you close your mouth. Do you know what happens when you close your mouth? You can hear. It's amazing. It's rocket science, friends. I know. Two of these, one of those. Two of these. That's the ratio. You've lost control of it. You're getting frustrated because you can't control people, can't control what they're doing, what they're saying, how they're acting, how they're behaving. Pastor, did you see this person and what they said? Now you control them because I can't. I don't want to do that. That's the last thing I want to do. I'm not going to waste my energies and my times trying to do the work of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to offer up the gospel. Christ died, resurrected, so that you might have life and have it more abundantly. And the more you walk with God, the more you allow the fruit, His fruit, His Spirit, to be awakened and to be planted in your life. You know what? I won't even have to control you because what will happen? Fruit will begin to come out. You'll be a more joyful person. You'll begin to become a more gentle person. You'll begin to have self-control over the things that you're meant to have control because you're now partnering with the Spirit of God that resides in you because you... My brothers and sisters, you, you're a priest. You're a priest. You're a priestess. That's how that functions. Old Testament, one man of God. New Testament, it's free for all because of the sacrifice of Christ. It's a new reality that he inaugurates. He changes everything. Look, I just want to encourage you, if this has been you, Simple message today. We all lose control from time to time. And and maybe this is you at the moment. You just feel like, man, my life is just so out of control. I just want to encourage you that 
you can make a decision today. You can put a, put a flag in the ground. You can have a marker that says, you know what, today I want to begin to renew my mind and to think differently. I want to give you that opportunity in a second. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to ask you if you've ever received Jesus and nobody's going to be looking around or they're being good, no one will look around. And I'm not going to embarrass you or get you up here to do anything that will make you feel uncomfortable. I'm just going to get you to put up your hand and you can put it back down. And, and then I'd just love to pray with you. And then I'm going to offer an invitation to you, which is simply this, that we as a church, as, as Central, we want to go on a journey with you. We love people. We love people. If you give us an opportunity, I think that you'll see how much we love you. We're not perfect. <laughs> Trust me. I work here, so we're definitely not perfect. But we do love people. And we love people and we try to love people the way Jesus loved people. And if you make that decision today, we want to journey with you. We would love your information. We would love to give you some next steps to be a source of inspiration, to be a source of encouragement to you. But if you're in this room right now, maybe just with every eye closed and heads bowed, if you could just honor and respect this moment just for a second, no moving around. If that's you and you just say, you know what, I've lost control of my life, but I want Jesus I want the Spirit of God to begin to work in my heart again. I, I want to know what it is to live with the fruit of the Spirit that's being born out in my life. If that's you right now, would you just raise your hand so I know that I'm praying with you? You can put it back down. Yeah, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah, eight, nine. That's awesome. You guys can put your hands there. Yeah, ten. I just saw you over there. I don't want to labor on this moment, but I do want to give you an opportunity of your heart's beating right now. And I encourage you that that is the Spirit of God speaking to your heart. He's always calling out. He's a gentle God. He will never force himself on you. But he is there ready and waiting. Just as I look around the room one more time, is there anybody else who would say, Pastor, would you pray for me? Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. That's so exciting. Yes, sir, I see your hand. That's great. Yes, ma'am, I saw your hand as well. That's so good. To walk with God is just one of the greatest things we can do. It's just hands going up. Look, even if you didn't get an opportunity to put up your hand, but you want to say this prayer in your heart, that's okay too. Jesus says, those who acknowledge me in front of man, I will also acknowledge in front of the Father in heaven. This is just your opportunity right now to acknowledge him with witnesses here in the room. So church, would you help me and would you help all these people who are wanting to change their lives, would you help us pray really quickly? Let's all say this together. Dear Jesus, come on church, let's use our outside voices today. Dear Jesus, I give you my heart. I give you my life. I repent of my sin. I repent of doing it my way. And I give it all to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, can we celebrate with these people today? It's such a great story. Thank you so much, Pastor Ron. Would you come up and pray us out?